We do not want to keep our troops in Afghanistan. I intend to remove all U.S. troops from Iraq by the end of 2011. Sectarian violence inside Baghdad as a consequence of our troop patrols. That's been purchased at the cost of increased U.S. casualties and is unsustainable. What we haven't seen is a significant disarming of the Shia militias. I've, again, during your testimony, you've told us that essentially the Shias decided, even before we got there, to, stand, to, to get on one knee and to wait it out. Iraqi leaders must rise above their differences and come together around a political plan for Iraq's future. Shia, Sunni, Kurds, all Iraqis must have confidence that they can advance their interests and aspirations through the political process rather than through violence. Now, it's not the place for the United States to choose Iraq's leaders. Uh, it is clear, though, that only leaders that can govern with an inclusive agenda are going to be able to truly bring the Iraqi people together uh, and help them through this crisis. Meanwhile, the United States will not pursue military options that support one sect inside of Iraq at the expense of another. President Obama believes that his words are more important than his actions, mm -hmm. right? So he says that we're not going to pick sides in a sectarian strife in Iraq, as we're sending 300 yeah. of our top troops, like our best mm -hmm. trained guys, to train one of the sects. No, I the think Shia 150 sect. is going to help the government. 150 is going to help ISIS, right? <laughs> it's going to be even-handed? No, so, I don't no, think so. We're going to go help the Shia. And then he says, you know, uh, we're not going to help Maliki if he's not going to help himself. I like that. That's true. Mm -hmm. Like, he has not done anything for the Sunnis. That's part of what has uh, fueled this civil war. But at the same time, we are going to help Maliki. Yeah. We're, I mean, that's what that's why we're sending our 300 best guys there, right? Yeah. I mean, you want to talk about a dream team, we're sending him the dream team. Yeah. That's helping him. As president, I will end misguided defense policies and stand with caucus for priorities in fighting special interests in Washington. I don't posture on defense policy, and I don't take money from federal lobbyists for powerful defense contractors. Look who Obama just brought in as his deputy defense secretary, a chief lobbyist for one of the greatest of all of the military industrial complex companies, Raytheon. As of today, lobbyists will be subject to stricter limits than under any other administration in history. Boy, you know, if you are one of the 70% of Americans who wants U.S. troops out of Iraq on that 16-month timetable that Obama promised, I bet you are glad about this election we just had, huh? Getting rid of that old administration that sees several tens of thousands of American troops indefinitely in Iraq for years. Wow, good thing we are saying goodbye to George W. Bush's Defense Secretary, Bob Gates. And now we're saying hello to Barack Obama's Defense Secretary, Bob Gates. We've got 130,000 Americans fighting halfway across the world in a war that should have never been waged, led by leaders who have no plan to end it. We don't have time to be cynical. The U.S. may try to get around the just-signed requirement that U.S. combat troops be out of Iraqi cities by June of next year by massaging the meaning of the word combat. You ready? Quote, military planners are now quietly acknowledging that many troops will stay behind as renamed trainers and advisors in what are effectively combat roles. In other words, they will still be engaged in combat, just called something else. I don't switch positions or make promises. They can't be kept. A nonviolent movement could not have halted Hitler's armies. Negotiations cannot convince Al Qaeda's leaders to lay down their arms. To say that force may sometimes be necessary is not a call to cynicism, it is a recognition of history, the imperfections of man, and the limits of reason. I raise this point. I begin with this point because in many countries there is a deep ambivalence about military action today. We need somebody who can take on the special interests and win. Uh, and I have consistently done that. On money and politics, in the state legislature, I passed landmark ethics legislation against not just Republicans, but also some of the leaders in my own party. I did the same thing working with Russ Feingold uh, with the ethics reform package that we passed last year. And the third thing is telling the truth to the American people even when it's tough. If where Obama promised in 2007 that he was going to label GMOs. Just so everyone's clear, 
This is what's going on. These are the lies that get people elected because they know oh, yeah. the public is for this. So maybe we could play that clip. He's going to be transparent, too. <laughs> Here's what I'll do as president. I'll immediately implement country of origin labeling because Americans should know where their food comes from. We'll let folks know whether their food has been genetically modified because Americans should know what they're buying. We'll let folks know whether their food has been genetically modified because Americans should know what they're buying. We agree. Now is the time to label genetically modified foods because Americans have a right to know what they're buying. And of course, he didn't keep that promise. You notice he says, immediately, we'll enact GMO labeling. And everyone's like, yeah, let's do it. Yay, we love you. Wait a minute. It's 2015. That was in 2007. <laughs> mm -hmm. That just shows, though, the manipulation. They know what people want. 90 plus percent want labeling. Yeah. But anyway. A party that doesn't just offer change as a slogan, but real, meaningful change. Change that America can believe in. That's why I'm in this race. That's why I'm running for the presidency of the United States of America. To offer change that we can believe in. When we summoned the entire nation to a common purpose, a higher purpose. And I run for the presidency of the United States of America because that is the party that America needs us to be right now. I am in this race to tell the corporate lobbyists that their days of setting the agenda in Washington are over. I have done more than any other candidate in this race to take on the lobbyists, and I have won. They have not funded my campaign, they will not work in my White House, and they will not drown out the voices of the American people when I am president. And he will not be able to say that I wavered on something as fundamental as whether or not it is okay for America to torture because it is never okay. That's why I'm in it. I will close Guantanamo. I will restore habeas corpus. I am running for president because I am sick and tired of Democrats thinking that the only way to look tough on national security is by talking and acting and voting like George Bush Republicans. But we are here today because of a very specific challenge, and that's countering violent extremism. Something that is not just a matter of military affairs. By violent extremism, we don't just mean the terrorists who are killing innocent people, we also mean the ideologies, the infrastructure of extremists, the propagandists, the recruiters, the funders, who radicalize and recruit or incite people to violence. We all know there is no one profile of a violent extremist or terrorist. So there's no way to predict who will become radicalized. Around the world and here in the United States, inexcusable acts of violence have been committed against people of different faiths, by people of different faiths, which is, of course, a betrayal of all our faiths. It's not unique to one group, or to one geography, or one period of time. But we are here at this summit because of the urgent threat from groups like Al-Qaeda and ISIL. And this week we are focused on prevention, preventing these groups from radicalizing, recruiting, or inspiring others to violence in the first place. I've called upon governments to come to the United Nations this fall with concrete steps that we can take together. And today, uh, what I want to do is suggest several areas where I believe we can concentrate our efforts. First, we have to confront squarely and honestly the twisted ideologies that these terrorist groups use to incite people to violence. Now, leading up to this summit, there's been a fair amount of debate in the press and among pundits about the words we use to describe and frame this challenge. 
the reality, which again many Muslim leaders have spoken to, is, is that there's a strain of thought that doesn't embrace ISIL's tactics, doesn't embrace violence, but does buy into the notion that the Muslim world has suffered historic grievances. Sometimes that's accurate. Does buy into the belief that so many of the ills in the Middle East flow from a history of colonialism or conspiracy. Does buy into the idea that Islam is incompatible with modernity or tolerance, or that uh, it's been polluted by Western values. And so those beliefs exist. In some communities around the world, they are widespread. And so it makes individuals, especially young people who already may be disaffected or alienated, more ripe for radicalization. So we've got to be able to talk honestly about those issues. We've got to be much more clear about how we're rejecting uh, certain ideas. There are certain universal precepts and values that need to be respected in this interconnected world. That's the beginnings of a partnership. As we go forward, we need to find new ways to amplify the voices of peace and tolerance and inclusion. And we especially need to do it online. Where young people have no education, they are more vulnerable to conspiracy theories and radical ideas because it's not tested against anything else. They've got nothing to weigh. And we've seen this across the Middle East and North Africa. And terrorist groups are all too happy to step into a void. They offer salaries to their foot soldiers they can, so they can support their families. Sometimes they offer social services, schools, health clinics, to do what local governments cannot or will not do. They try to justify their violence in the name of fighting the injustice of corruption that steals from the people. <laughs> Even while those terrorist groups end up committing even worse abuses like kidnapping and human trafficking. So if we're going to prevent people from being susceptible to the false promises of extremism, then the international community has to offer something better. And the United States intends to do its part. I will provide our intelligence and law enforcement agencies with the tools they need to track and take out the terrorists without undermining our Constitution and our freedom. The programs that have been discussed over the last couple of days in the press uh, are secret in the sense that they're classified, but they're not secret in the sense that uh, when it comes to telephone calls, every member of Congress has been briefed on this program. That means no more illegal wiretapping of American citizens. What uh, the intelligence community is doing is looking at phone numbers and durations of calls. No more national security letters to spy on citizens who are not suspected of a crime. No more tracking citizens who do nothing more than protest a misguided war. What uh, the intelligence community is doing is looking at phone numbers and durations of calls. No more ignoring the law when it is inconvenient. They may identify potential leads with respect to folks who might engage in terrorism. That is not who we are. Uh, we've also set up an audit process uh, when I came into office to make sure that we're, after the fact, making sh uh, absolutely certain that uh, all the safeguards are being properly observed. And it's not what is necessary to defeat the terrorists. My assessment and my team's assessment uh, was that they help us prevent terrorist attacks. We will again set an example for the world that the law is not subject to the whims of stubborn rulers and that justice is not arbitrary. This administration acts like violating civil liberties is the way to enhance our security. It is not. There are no shortcuts to protecting America. Uh, you can't have 100% security and also then have 100% privacy and 
zero inconvenience. To seize this moment, we have to ensure free and full exchange of information. And that starts with an open internet. I will take... I will take a back seat to no one in my commitment to network neutrality. Because once providers start to privilege some applications or websites over others, then the smaller voices get squeezed out and we all lose. The internet is perhaps the most open network in history and we have to keep it that way. They understood that our power alone cannot protect us, nor does it entitle us to do as we please. Instead, they knew that our power grows through its prudent use. Our security emanates from the justness of our cause, the force of our example, the tempering qualities of humility and restraint. And even as we confront a vicious adversary that abides by no rules, I believe the United States of America must remain a standard bearer in the conduct of war. That is what makes us different from those whom we fight. That is a source of our strength. That is why I prohibited torture. That is why I ordered the prison at Guantanamo Bay closed. And that is why I have reaffirmed America's commitment to abide by the Geneva Conventions. I have unequivocally prohibited the use of torture by the United States. And I have ordered the prison at Guantanamo Bay closed by early next year. Today, the Department is submitting to Congress our plan for finally closing the facility at Guantanamo once and for all. I don't want to pass this problem on to the next president, whoever it is. Guantanamo will be closed uh, no later than one year from now. We will be... Uh, is there a separate uh, executive order, Greg, with respect to how we're going to dispose of the detainees? Is that... Uh, we'll set up a process. That we will be setting up a process uh, whereby this is going to be taking place. Um, uh, President Obama, unfortunately for those who don't like him, has earned um, the trust of most Americans uh, because uh, regardless how you feel about his policies, regardless of the criticisms I may have of, of policies of his or decisions he's made, uh, he has told the truth. And uh, until proven otherwise, I think that uh, that's been his track record uh, for his years uh, both in Congress uh, uh, in the Senate, I mean, and, and uh, in the White House, and so, uh, so uh, to, for me, he gets the uh, he gets the benefit of the doubt. What I don't think we're being told. I mean, I mean, I mean, yeah. I mean, I mean, I mean, I mean, I mean Michael, let me just ask you something on that. I mean, yeah. when he said bef before he was elected uh, that he would close down Guantanamo Bay, and then he doesn't do that. I mean, that's not entirely being straight with the electorate, is it? Well, he hasn't done it yet. Uh, that's not telling a lie. And by passing health care, the Democrats saved their brand. A few months ago, a few months ago, Sarah Palin mockingly asked them, how's that Hopi changey thing working out for you? <laughs> Great, actually. Thanks for asking. <laughs> All the amazing things that happened over these last 10 years are really just a testament to you. In the same way that when we talk about our amazing military, as, as cool as the hardware is, and we got cool hardware, as cool as the machines and weapons and satellites are, ultimately it comes down to remarkable people. Thank you, everybody. Yes, we did. Yes, we can. God bless America. I think the problem isn't just how we fought the war. It's that we fought the war in the first place. This isn't just a problem of execution. It is a problem of conception. Uh, at the time, I was a candidate for the United States Senate. And I spoke out strongly in opposition to war. Nearly all of my opponents for the Democratic nomination for president made a different choice and voted to authorize war. Have you ever heard more drivel coming from somebody who's not even the president? And only Bernie LaPlante knows he stole the part. Another man filled his shoes. Hi, Jose. He's a fake. <laughs> he looked the part. He didn't tell me he was so cute. He saved my life. 
He acted the part, and only Bernie LaPlante knows he stole the part. Where are we looking at? This one right here? Yeah. Devin, we are proud of you. We are grateful for your service. Uh, we want to get you back home. We are going to need more troops in Afghanistan. Uh, we want to get you back home. My brother's now in Afghanistan. Uh, we want to get you back home. We are going to need more troops in Afghanistan. He said one thing, I'm not against all wars, I'm against dumb wars. Okay. He, that's what he said. I think the problem isn't just how we fought the war, it's that we fought the war in the first place. You can't believe one word you see on TV. Not one word. I was inspired by that hero. That fake inspired you? We cannot continue to rely only on our military in order to achieve the national security objectives that we've set. We've got to have a civilian national security force that's just as powerful, just as strong, just as well funded. Obama's health care plan will provide subsidies for families who cannot afford Medicaid. Obama's health care plan will be able to provide participants the ability to move from job to job without taking the health care coverage. Obama's health care plan will extend coverage to young adults up to the age of 25 through their parents' plan. Because of Obama, I'm inspired to be the next architect. Because of Obama, I'm inspired to be the next chemical engineer. Because of Obama, I'm inspired to be the next entrepreneur. Yes, we can. 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 بلغ عني يا أبتا أني أبغي وجه الله إن أرضى الكفار أناس فمرادي أن يرضى الله Yes we can! Teach us that one and they make challenges to your nation and their lives But they must never see God to despair Yes we can! طريق النصر حسبوه يأتي في يسر أو من غير دماء تجري أين جهاد رسول الله أو من غير دماء وأنا أدعوكم وأنادي فاعتصموا بالنور الهادي Welcome to the desert of the real. Welcome to the desert of the real. I know what you're trying to do. I'm trying to free your mind, Neo.